All right, so hello everyone. My name is Tyler Kelly. I'm a third year graduate student at UC Irvine, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the work I've been doing embedding Milky Way-like disks in cosmological simulations alongside these three bearded people. So just a little introduction, detecting the small or low mass dark matter, dark halos is a, an important test for the Lambda CDM model. And in order to carry out this test, it's important to have accurate uh, predictions for not only the counts, but also the spatial distribution of what these, uh, where these halos are gonna be located. So with the uh, relative new addition of halo or hydro simulations, uh, we've been discovering that uh, we can't really do this with dark matter only simulations. So if you look at the inner regions of uh, around a dark matter only simulation compared to its equivalent in a hydrodynamic simulation, you see that there are significant differences uh, in terms of the subhalo counts. And that gets even worse if you look at just the inner 15 kiloparsecs where there are practically nothing to be detected through techniques such as uh, stream heating. In addition to this, computationally, the hydro simulations are roughly an order of 100 times more expensive than the dark matter counterparts. And so that begs the question, can we get these results without having to go through the computational cost of these simulations? And the answer that I believe and that we believe is yes, you can. So if you look at a galaxy out in the universe, uh, you've got the central galaxy and then it's in its dark matter halo with a bunch of little uh, sub halos around it. And of course it's traveling through the cosmos on some trajectory. In order to put this into a dark matter only simulation, uh, we put a sink particle at the center of a halo and through dynamical friction, it will track the center. And then to that sink particle, we attach an analytic potential that will grow with time. And of course, it's in a cosmological simulation. So you may ask, how well does this work? Well, qualitatively, if you look at the inner regions between these two runs for the hydro and then its equivalent with the disk embedded, uh, you can see that it does a reasonably good job. And in terms of the computational cost of these two runs, uh, it does it in a fraction of the time that the HydroSim took to run. So we can look at the Vmax functions, subhalo Vmax functions of two halos that were run using this technique from the latte simulations. And looking, you can see that the dark matter plus disk does a really good job of matching the hydro simulations results to the order of about 20%. And there's one note that I want to highlight here is that if you look at the original sort of dark matter only uh, populations, the level of disruption varies significantly from halo to halo, even with just these two halos alone. And so there's uh, an indicator that the halo to halo variation is going to be an important factor to take into account. So the highlights of this technique are that it's a fast and accurate way to account for this enhanced disruption, and then you can uh, essentially make your galaxy potential look exactly like what you want it to without having to run a bunch of simulations and hoping for one that looks reasonably correct. So with this sort of foundation laid, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the Make It Work Milky Way simulation suite, where Make It Work just means that we are going to force our galaxy potentials to be Milky Way-like as best as we can, and we're going to embed them in 12 different cosmological halos with the goal of predicting uh, low mass dark subhalo or making predictions for low mass dark subhalos. So how did I do this? Well, I matched the Z of zero Milky Way as best as I could and I grow it, grow into that using candles and a combination of candles and abundance matching. And then I use a triple Miyamoto Nagai disc in order to match my exponential disc. I include multiple components slightly increase my mass resolution compared to the latte simulations. And probably the biggest thing is that I increased my sample size to get a better handle on the halo to halo variation that is present. So of these 12 runs, 
I have completed all of them, but I've only analyzed four at this moment, so we'll just take a look at the four that I have completed. If we look at the radio profile, you can see that overall there's roughly a factor of two disruption uh, between the dark matter only and this disk, and that continues to about 50 kiloparsecs. And as you continue inwards, uh, you start to see that there's virtually nothing inside the central regions uh, within uh, 50 or 15 kiloparsecs. So that takes care of the, uh, where these subhalos are destructed. So it's preferentially destroyed or destroys halos that pass close to the central halo or the central galaxy. And if we look at when these subhalos were disrupted, we can use the uh, accretion time of the surviving subhalos. So the subhalos that make it to redshift zero, look at when they fell into uh, the host halo. And the medians tell you that in dark matter only, the half the halos fell in and by roughly five big years into the edge of the universe. But if you add a disk, half of them that survived fell in by redshift, or sorry, uh, uh, seven and a half giga years. So this pushes it way back, or way later into the age of the universe, and this has a, a good effect on the uh, quenching time scales that are needed to match the observations that we see around the local group. And so in conclusion, uh, just the mere presence of a central galaxy, whether it's dark matter only, or, or sorry, an embedded disk or through hydro uh, has a significant impact on the uh, subhalo counts. And then uh, embedding a uh, potential within the dark matter only simulations does a great job of re sort of capturing this destruction that we see in the hydro simulations. And then I'm running uh, 12 of these simulations with the embedded Milky Way disks with the resolution with the ability to resolve uh, 10 to the 6 subhalos. And eventually, once I'm finished, I will make the uh, halo catalogs and murder trees public so that you may use them if you would like. And then just to highlight some things that are going to change, uh, this is going to have an impact on the accretion times of surviving satellites, so the uh, quenching models, um, predictions for dark, dark subhalo searches, uh, subhalo abundance matching, completeness corrections for all of the major surveys that are out there, uh, and stellar halo formation, and many more. And so if you've used uh, simulations such as Elvis or something like that to do uh, subhalo studies, I would encourage you to redo those simulations using a more realistic uh, subhalo population that I will provide for you. And then just a final note that this will be expanded, this technique will be expanded to include group-like systems. We're running Full hydro at this mass resolution is just not feasible. Thank you. So uh, Tyler actually finished much earlier than uh, the allotted time, so there's lots of time for discussion. Uh, so comments or questions? Thank you. So we need to uh, do my systems. Do we only add a disk or we need Right, so we haven't exactly looked at uh, ellipticals just yet, not at least into the extent that we have with the Milky Ways, uh, but we would definitely expand it to be, instead of a disk, it would be more of a Hernquist type shape. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Because this is Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one of the goals and the reasons that we will be expanding it to this. Because if there is a significant depletion within the inner regions, then you're not going to see something if you're looking for a signal with the lensing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes. And if we're all missing, so at what direction would we send the bits? Uh, so the redshift was set that we added the disk in was at redshift three. Uh, do, yeah. Just to, David, is there anything in your setup that would enable the satellites to end up sort of more on the planar structure around? Oh, so if or not, I'm you're sorry. asking if we if we see sort of like a planar satellite structure? Is there anything that you set up to work to achieve that? Or is there uh, 
No, we don't explicitly incorporate anything, and I don't, I don't believe that we see anything. You don't have any access to any network just without filtering to any. Oh, okay, I get more. So the, the, one of the things is that the potential is fixed. The disk is fixed in the XY plane. Computationally, it wouldn't be feasible to have it tilt. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Uh, let me ask something. So uh, there's a different simulation of a 10 to the 13 solar mass halo, which would host a very massive halo, mm -hmm. that was run by uh, Piero Nadal and a postdoc whose name I'm unfortunately forgotten uh, at ETH. Okay. And uh, then they also ran a fairly high resolution hydro simulation. And what they found was just the opposite, namely that the baryonic contraction, the adiabatic contraction, actually pulls in uh, the halos, uh, the okay. small systems yeah. that were around this elliptical, and it enhances the uh, number of potentially lensing subhalos, yeah. uh, which would, of course, uh, make the people who are looking for that happy. Uh, so uh, I'll just add another comment. Uh, a recent paper by uh, Carlos Frank and collaborators showed, as other people have also explained, that if you look for uh, subhalos, 10 to the 8 solar mass objects, uh, in lensing galaxies, that even if the lensing galaxy itself uh, has been stripped of the subhalos in the inner region around the Einstein radius, 7 kiloparsecs or something like that for typical galaxies, uh, the line of sight, the objects along the line of sight, foreground, background, will provide plenty of those small halos. And so uh, it becomes an important test for cold dark matter versus warm dark matter or other things. Cold dark matter absolutely predicts that the observers will find these. Uh, so question, uh, you said that it's expensive to run these very massive simulations, but actually yeah. some of them have been run up to 10 to the 13 solar masses. Uh, the fire simulations led by uh, Robert Feldman, for example. Uh, yeah. They only ran them down to ratio of two. I right. realize it's expensive to run a few of them down to ratio of zero. But yeah. I think it'd be pretty important to see if the fire simulations are similar to or different from these hydro simulations that were run by Nadal. Yeah. Any plans to do that? Um, so I'm not actively running fire simulations, but maybe Shay or Dushan might have something to add to that. So, Crystal Lee, uh, Greg Lee, and Tiffany Lee here at Santa Cruz is the next slot. So, of course, we'll get some extra time. <laughs> 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 we can be somewhat relaxed because uh, uh, one of the speakers in this session.